Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Welcome to our brand new building, our Building 99 lecture room. This is actually one of the first talks I ever hosted here. Um, it is my great pleasure to uh, introduce Suzanne Rivoli from, uh, from Stanford Electrical Engineering Department. Um, she is the uh, final year PhD student in electrical engineering and advised by Christos um, Karsrakis, if I pronounce it right. Uh, right. And um, she has been working in the area of uh, power modeling and uh, benchmarking for you know, large-scale comp enterprise computing and data centers for quite some time. She actually uh, also worked at HP Labs, working with Arthur, um, who probably many of us have heard, and have written a couple of very interesting papers, including a paper called the Dual Sword that uh, last year at uh, the ACM uh, Sigmoid. And uh, uh, today, what she's going to uh, cover is the uh, Mantis and the Dual Sword, the two pieces of the uh, two pieces of the system. One is on the power modeling of uh, desktop systems. The other one is on the benchmarking of the enterprise large-scale computing system. So with that, I'll have uh, Suzanne to take over. Thank you. So I'm Suzanne Rivoir, and I'm presenting today on power models and metrics in enterprise computing, uh, specifically Mantis, which is an approach to power modeling, and JewelSort, which is a benchmark for energy efficiency. I probably don't need to convince anyone here of this, but why are we working on energy efficiency? Because it's really important. In mobile computing, we've known for some time that uh, power directly impacts how much you can get done on a given battery, which of course affects the usability of the device. On the desktop, people are starting to worry about both electricity costs and just noise of all the cooling systems. So you see things like the quiet PC movement where people are trying to get mobile components on their desktop for that reason. And of course, what most of us here care about in data centers, where you have thousands of computers, this problem only multiplies. So you have the cost of the power for the machines themselves. You have to provision air conditioning to cool them. Then you have the power for the cooling devices, which is, they say, half a watt to a watt for every watt of compute power. You have reliability concerns. When things get too hot, components fail. Um, you have concerns about densibility and scalability. If you're going to build this building to house computers, you want to pack as many in it as possible. If things are too hot, that limits <laughs> your ability to do so. Finally, pollution, we're hearing a lot more about the environment and global warming these days, and computers and data centers are becoming a bigger part of that. And finally, the load on local utilities. If you have a data center that's consuming enough power, your local utility may not be willing or happy to provide that power. What my work focuses on is models and metrics rather than optimizations for energy efficiency themselves. So if you're going to improve the energy efficiency of the system in some way, you're implicitly relying, or explicitly, relying on two things. One is a metric. You've decided how you're going to evaluate your solution and what you're trying to improve. And one is a model. The idea of whether you're designing a system or whether you're implementing a policy in the data center, you want to have some idea of how your changes are going to affect the system. So what I'm presenting today is Mantis, which is an approach to full system power modeling that's non-intrusive, lightweight, and suitable for use in online policies like in a data center. And I'm presenting JewelSort, which is a full system energy efficiency benchmark. Um, it's the first complete benchmark proposed for energy efficiency at the system level. And the idea, as with most benchmarks, is to inspire and compare designs on the basis of energy efficiency. The first piece of this talk is Mantis, um, which we published in a workshop in 2006, and which I'm coming back to now as I finish up my thesis. So I'll share with you what we have done and what we're in the process of doing. So I'm going to describe the goals of this model how we create it, the experimental evaluation that we have done, and what we're in the process of finishing up. The goal of this particular power model is to develop an online model that's suitable for use in data center scheduling policies. And so the requirements of such a model are, first, that it be full system and not limited to any specific component. Second, that it be non-intrusive, that it not interfere with the performance of systems, and that it be easy for the end user, the data center operator, to implement that it be fast enough to provide the real-time computations that a scheduler needs, that it be, of course, reasonably accurate, and we think within 5 to 10 percent is reasonable for this sort of optimization, that it be inexpensive, and that it be reasonably generic, that is, portable to different types of systems without too much effort. Previous approaches to power modeling have been, well, the two extremes are, first, software only, and second, hardware only. So at the software side, you have these simulation-based, detailed models. 
they're inexpensive unless you value the time of grad students, but they don't really require any expensive equipment. Um, they can be made arbitrarily accurate. They tend not to be full system because modeling a full system at that level is extremely complicated. They're slow, of course, because they are in simulation. And they're tailored specifically to particular systems and components. You can't really take one and use it to model something very different. On the other side of the spectrum, we have direct hardware measurements. Just plug everything into a watt meter. This is, of course, accurate. It's fast. It's easy. It is expensive. It adds to the cost of the machines, um, especially to do it a high granularity. And additionally, it has no predictive power. So it's fine to survey the current state of the system or data center. But if you're trying to figure out what your change is going to do to the next state, you really have no way of knowing that from just measuring hardware. You need a model. So the question we try to answer with Mantis is, can we use high-level software metrics to approximate the accuracy of these other models while being fast and inexpensive? So our approach looks something like this. You run a one-time calibration scheme to, develop, to find the model parameters. And our ideal is that hopefully the vendor of the system could do this part, and then it could be applicable to every such system that's in a data center. So what you want to do here is to stress the individual components that are of interest. And in a server, that would be the CPU, the memory, the disk, and the network. The outputs of the calibration scheme are a set of time-stamped performance metrics, and I'll talk about what those are, correlated to the AC power measurements at the same time. The next step is to fit model parameters to this calibration data. And then finally, in a real data center environment, to use this model to predict power. So in this setup, all you need are the performance metrics at each point in time. And then your output is an estimate of the AC power of that system. So let's talk about the calibration phase. The idea here, as I said, is to stress each component in isolation to develop a model of how that component contributes to the system's power. What we use for the calibration phase is a software program called Gamut that was developed by Justin Moore that is able to stress these components at varying degrees of utilization. So you specify how much you want to stress the component, and Gamut does that for you. There's nothing magical about Gamut. You could do any program or build one yourself that can do this. But there are some caveats to Gamut or any program that would attempt to do this work. My slides are running away from me. The first is that these programs run as user programs on top of the OS, so you don't have complete control of the hardware. The second thing is that getting CPU power in particular, and probably any component power, to the absolute maximum may require specific architectural knowledge, and we've taken a look at that. So it matters what instructions you run on a given processor. And finally, that you have overheads associated with the program and with the OS that prevent it from totally maxing out subsystems. So if you're looking to stress anything to 100%, these are three reasons why you might not get there. But we find that what Gamut is able to do is good enough. So next, once we have the calibration data from Gamut, the metrics that we sample and the power measurements, we create a model. So the inputs to the model are the outputs from Gamut. And the output of the model is an equation relating power to those metrics. And we've been looking at a linear model, but there's no reason that this approach has to use one. The utilization metrics that we use in the study I'm showing today are CPU utilization that you would get from the OS expressed as a percentage, the off-chip memory access count, which we've been getting from performance counters, the hard disk I.O. rate, and the network I.O. rate from things such as SAR. And then the output is, if you're using a linear model, it's an equation that looks like this. So A is the idle power of the system. When you're doing a black box model like this, you can't fully disambiguate the component powers. So I can't tell you your CPU is using this much power. What I can tell you is that the delta in your CPU from idle, if it's running at 70%, I can tell you how much that delta is. But I can't tell you the CPU in itself. So A is that lumped together idle power for the system. Then B is the coefficient that goes along with the CPU utilization, C with the memory, D with the disk, E with the network. So. A lot of you have probably done this kind of modeling, and it's no surprise that the input is a matrix M with coefficients for each of these at each point in time, and adi additionally a vector of the measured power at each point in time. And then the output is a solution that gives you those weights A through E, or whatever you're using for each metric. So now I'm going to talk about the evaluation of this. Um, we used to initially evaluate this two very different and strange machines. They are strange, so I don't know how generally applicable this would be on a more normal, normal server, but what's great is that they're at really opposite ends of the spectrum. And so that tells us something about how generalizable things are, and additionally could raise some red flags that you miss if you just use a run-of-the-mill server. So the first system we used, and this is all hardware from a couple years ago, um, is a power-optimized blade server. So as you might expect, it has low power processor states. It has a laptop disk. The second is a compute-optimized Itanium server. And this was Itanium before any sort of power-saving technology in the processor whatsoever. 
And secondly, this particular server was a prototype that was instrumented for us. And in this particular prototype, the resources were heavily imbalanced in favor of the processors. So let's go through that. So in the Blade server, our CPU is a mobile Turion. We had 512 megs of memory. And we had just one disk, which was a laptop disk. In the Itanium server, we had four Itanium 2 processors. We also ran these numbers with one, but four is uh, the worst case for our model, so I'm showing you those. We only had a gig of memory for all these processors, which is the first clue that this is an oddly provisioned machine. We had one WIMPy disk, and both of these machines were connected to Ethernet. So the models that we developed to give you some idea of the coefficients and the limitations of this process, looking at uh, the A column first gives you the idle power of these two systems, so pretty different. 15 watts for the blade, 640 for the four Itanium 2 processors and the big old server. So I should also note that I've normalized these U's to between 0 and 1. So the maximum value of a metric seen during calibration, I've normalized to 1 and the minimum to 0. So what we see is that uh, the CPU at its highest contributes 23, 24 watts according to this model on the blade. The memory is negative here, and the disk contributes another 22, which if you, if you add all these together, that's, um, that's much higher than the blade power is actually going to be. So what's going on here? The first is that there's some nonlinearities and some correlations between these components. The second thing specifically about CPU and memory is that on this particular blade, CPU and memory are on the same power plane. We found them interacting in some strange ways. But what I want you to take away from this is that even though these coefficients are kind of bogus, this linear model works out all right. And that's really what we're trying to do here is to do something that's good enough and generic enough. Looking at the itanium, we see that there's really not a ton of dynamic variation in the system. So there's four CPUs, 11 watts each, maximum contribution over idle. We've got 15 watts for the memory, 17 for the disk. I should note for the network, it's about zero uh, for both of these systems. And the reason for that I understand is that for 10100 Ethernet, the power consumption is dependent only on the link speed and not on the data rate. Yeah? So how do you measure the zero for disk? You set it down or you just keep it idle? Uh, you're not sending any requests to it through gamut. So, well, so on, on the blade I am too, and I think that's probably because there's some interaction that's being captured there. Um, on the itanium, well, okay, so the answer on both systems is that it additionally picks up on components that correlate with the CPU, the memory, and the disk. So we're not looking at just the DC power of those things. We're looking at other things in the system that can get swept up in that coefficient. Um, It's focused completely, right. But your point is, the memory clearly is not saving by being used more. So, but your point is, the, the overall number, yes. the individuals are wrong, the overall looks pretty good. So exactly. I mean, the, the blade disk is the number that's the most wrong, clearly. Um, but yeah, the overall numbers don't have to be right. They, they pick up on correlations between the components and other things in the system that correlate to the different components. And... Yeah, there's a specific problem actually in that system, um, which is that this particular system, which was a prototype, right, had an implementation of HPUX that wasn't correctly halting. So we discovered this when we found that the power during spec JBB was lower than the idle power. <laughs> um, so that lowers the dynamic range dramatically. Um, we additionally found that with the Itanium, it really matters which instructions you're executing. And I would speculate that's, you know, the VLIW bundles matter a lot. Um, and so what we're going to see is that just CPU utilization as a percentage is not a terrific way to capture that. Um, but so <laughs> the, the dynamic variation on the Itanium is much lower because the OS isn't doing what it's supposed to be doing. Yeah? Is this competitive or aggressive? Uh, yeah. Do you have any confidence to roll that come out of that as well? I will show you 90th percentile error. I don't, I don't have the confidence intervals on these numbers. Yeah? Right. Um, that would actually be a really useful thing to do, just because you're never sure you've got the correlations perfect between the different samples, but it's not something that we did. So the error here, <laughs> um, we used the following benchmarks. We used just a simple matrix multiply that bangs on mostly the CPU and also the memory at its largest size. We used stream, which is a pure memory benchmark, and then a bunch of spec benchmarks. 
Uh, the first thing to note is that we're over predicting on everything except stream on the blade. And you may recall that the memory coefficient there is negative. So on a benchmark that highly stresses memory, that's going to catch up to us. Um, the 90th percentile absolute error is, uh, well, it's the absolute error, so you're not under predicting. But we're within 10% on everything except spec int on the itanium. And the reason there is pretty much what I said, the fact that it matters what instructions are being executed on the itanium. And I think I have the results in backup slides only, but we're able to get that down when we use a better measure of what the CPU is doing. Yeah? So, so this is error versus uh, absolute versus zero, where you have, what, what is the actual amount of variation you have on the citation with no uh, Right. Variation? Yeah, that's the question no one ever asks me, and that definitely should be asked. Um, <laughs> thank you, you're the first person to do so. Um, yeah, so the, that's, the, that's the thing. The amount of dynamic variation is actually not that high, right? You, yeah, you'd probably do better than this. You wouldn't do as well on the other programs. So this is, uh, this is ongoing for the reasons that you've pointed out. And so the conclusions are, first of all, that we have this simple high-level generic way to approximate full system power, but we're doing some work on this. Uh, the first thing is to evaluate it on more systems. Yeah, sorry. Um, it's the absolute error, actually. Yeah. Uh, no. Right. Yeah, so we're working on making this more sophisticated is the next piece. Um, so first of all, to evaluate it on more systems. These are strange, which is helpful for pointing out some limitations of models that have just been tested on one type of system. But on the other hand, they're strange. So we're looking to evaluate them on more systems. The second thing is, what we're trying to do is to specify uh, metrics in a generic way that can be applied to a lot of systems, and also to figure out what the smallest set of metrics that we can use is. So there was a Google paper in uh, ISCA 2007 where they were able to get away with using CPU utilization as reported by the OS only. And they were looking at this property over a whole group of homogeneous systems, which may be the reason that they were able to do that simplification, but we don't know, and we're interested in looking at these things as well. And we're also interested in looking at more sophistication because we're not sure that we've correlated samples 100% correctly. It's, there's always a little bit of error in that. Quit moving ahead. Yeah. Could you talk a little about the linearity of single elements? Just take a CPU, run uh -huh. it off, and measure precisely how much power it takes. Yes. Does it, is it linear from 0 to 100% GP? Um, how linear it is? Right. I don't remember. I think roughly, but I, what, what we suspect for a lot of these components is that piecewise linear is the answer. Right. 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 If you fix the piece state, yeah, it's linearish, but. Right, so, right, right, so the question, yeah, right, right. right. Right, or you develop separate models for every piece state. But if you're going to employ it in a scheduler, you have to be pretty sure that your piece state's going to stay, stay the same. So yeah, we've been looking at processors that are at least active idle. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a definite caveat to this method. So what we've been looking at is making the model more sophisticated, uh, specifying a minimum set of generic metrics, in particular replacing that CPU utilization percentage, because we saw some real problems with that on the Itanium. And we had better success with performance counters that give us things like number of instructions dispatched that are more correlated to what the CPU is really doing. Because CPU utilization just tells you how much of the time you were doing anything at all, 
But depending on the processor, it really matters what that thing was. So we're looking into that. Um, we're looking into improving the infrastructure for generating this model, which is uh, another thing I'm working on now, automating the processes as much as possible. And finally, you know, we need a use case employing this in a data center. And uh, this is what I'm working on right now. Are there any more questions before I move on to the next piece? Yeah. Right. It's hard to know what, 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 what flat out really means. Right, yeah. I, <laughs> I went over that. On the Itanium, we actually had, um, because we are at HP, we had a program that is specifically designed to run before the OS load just to burn power. And you're right, we can't get up to that on top of the OS with program overhead, et cetera. If you're just constructing a linear model, you know, you don't need all those points. But if we're trying to do something more sophisticated, it becomes pretty difficult for the reasons you said. Yeah. Um, that the error was so large? Um, no, the most prominent sources of error that we saw were the memory CPU interaction in the blade hurting us when we only stressed memory. This is a benchmark that's pretty much, uh, insofar as it's possible to only stretch memory, stress memory, it does it. And the other error that we saw was a consequence of using CPU utilization instead of a more um, revealing measure for the titanium <coughs> CPU, which is very vulnerable to that kind of thing. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to fit something that is nonlinear, which is what the blade certainly looks like, into a linear model, you know, there's going to be weirdness that will hit you in the extreme cases, and hopefully it's good enough in general. Yeah. Not that I want to add more friendly to the model. Yeah. Um, no, we didn't. Um, my collaborator on this work, Dimitri Sakonamu, did some work at IBM that suggested that that may be necessary to get the model within like 3% accuracy. Um, but in the 5 to 10 range, it should be okay. Right. 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 So um, we did sample the fan speed on the Itanium as well. On this particular prototype, however, it pretty much was only using one speed, so that was a bust. But in a fan that has multiple speeds, that's an important piece of the puzzle. Right, but if, if that local temperature is adjusted by adjusting the fan speeds, then that's where the problem comes in that you were discussing. Or, or you can just get rid of the variable that says we're only going to test at 7 degrees and we're going to test yeah, at yeah. Oh, yeah. everyone's system, yeah. Right. What may say to you, I mean, is data, data center applications seem to be the only one that needs to sort of be screened to just sort of reliability on the process of right. being able to push it to that limit. So right. maybe That may be. And, um, well, actually, so what I'm planning to do is to compare this approach with the much simpler models that have been proposed. And one straw man for that is just a constant model for any given P state, say. And, you know, maybe that captures it in the 20 to 50 percent utilization band as well. Are there any more questions about Mantis? Okay. So the next piece, the benchmarking piece, is on the dual sort energy efficiency benchmark. So first of all, why a benchmark for energy efficiency? And the reason is, as with most benchmarks, we want to track the progress that's being made in this area, and we want to inspire researchers to improve them. 
And I should say that the, the dual sort benchmark, like the other sort benchmarks, which I'll discuss, is primarily intended to be used as a tool by researchers and not by marketers. Um, and the design of the benchmark reflects that. <laughs> I'm sure that'll keep them from using it. It probably will. <laughs> The sort benchmark has historically been fairly free of that. So here's hoping you know, this addition to the suite will continue that tradition. Um, so current em efforts in energy efficiency benchmarking besides us are the Green Grid, which is uh, an industrial consortium of a lot of hardware vendors. And what they're trying to do is propose a metric that works at the data center level. Then we have Energy Star, which recently proposed standards for computers. And we have the Spec Power and Performance Committee, which has been hoping to release their benchmark in late 2007. The limitations of all the current energy efficiency benchmarking efforts are, first, that they're underspecified. They may specify a metric without the workload you're supposed to run to get that metric. Or they're under construction, as with the spec benchmark. Or they're focused on a particular component, like just the processor, or domain, like just embedded computing. What's been missing is a complete full system benchmark. That is, when I say complete, I mean you have a workload to run, a metri metric by which to compare systems, and some rules for doing so fairly, which is particularly important with energy efficiency because you really need to specify how you're going to measure power and energy. So the contributions of this work are twofold. First, the specification of the dual sort benchmark, so the workload, the metric, and the guidelines, and of course the rationale by, of how we developed it and some of the pitfalls that you run into in trying to design a benchmark whose metric is energy efficiency. Then we're going to describe energy efficient system design by looking at the 2007 benchmark winner that we designed, which is three and a half times better than anything else we could get our hands on, and uh, the insights it yields into future designs. So our design goals for this benchmark were several. First, we wanted it to be holistic. That is, if it's a full system benchmark, we want to be sure it exercises the components of the system and not just one of them. We want it to be inclusive and representative. We want it to be implementable on many different types of machines, ideally, you know, the whole spectrum from PDAs to supercomputers. And we want it, of course, to be meaningful on as many of these machines as possible. We would like it to be history-proof in order to make meaningful comparisons as technology evolves. In other words, we would like to be able to compare a score five years from now with a score today. The workload that we chose to achieve these goals is external sort um, for the reasons that it's been used as a benchmark for the last 20 years. First, that it's simple and that it's balanced among the core components. So it exercises the CPU, memory, disk, I.O. And at the software level, the OS and file system can make a big difference in sort performance. It applies to systems small and large, PDAs to supercomputers. You can implement it, and it represents sequential I.O. that all these systems might do. Yeah. So I think... It's I.O. intensive by comparison with other benchmarks. And what I mean by that is w the point that most people want to get to to design a resource efficient sort is to get to a point where your CPU sorting bandwidth, and your CPU is doing work, right, matches your I.O. bandwidth. And the data is pa passing in and out of memory as well. Um, and so the way this is normally achieved because of the mismatch in performance between today's CPU and I.O. is to add a lot more I.O. than we usually think of in a system. So in that sense, it's exaggerated towards systems that have a lot of I.O. But that doesn't mean it doesn't stress the other components of the systems. So the CPU is not idle. It should be going full speed this whole time. <laughs> For most systems, yeah, absolutely. So right, this is a benchmark that focuses on systems that are more I.O. intensive than the traditional system that's built today. That's absolutely true. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Right. So um, 
The sort workload as specified by the benchmark is one particular workload. And the software, we were mostly focusing on hardware design, so the software that we used um, is a program that does some amount of figuring out its configuration, but we didn't take it and individually really tune it for each machine because we wanted to try and compare apples to apples as much as possible. What we did do is you know, make sure that the hardware, at least for our winning system, make sure that the hardware was an intelligent balance so that you're not wasting resources. So in other words, if you have a CPU that's sitting around waiting for I.O., you should be using a less powerful CPU. If you have too many disks, take one out. So that's something we definitely tuned because you need that to be energy efficient. But we didn't tune the software. So some other reasons that people have historically liked sort is that it's hard to cheat. Um, if you start with a bunch of randomly permuted records and somehow wind up with a bunch of sorted records, that's because you sorted them. Um, it's been a technology trend bellwether historically. So the winners of the previous sort benchmarks foreshadowed the transition from supercomputers to clusters. And one of the recent uh, prize performance sort benchmark winners used a GPU, and we're hearing a lot about GPUs in general purpose computing these days. So it's been an interesting look at what may be on the horizon for some time. And finally, it gives an end-to-end -end measure of improvement. That is, if I really improve one component, what the sort will give me is the overall effect on the system. We like that. So I've mentioned the existing sort benchmarks. And since Microsoft is a ground zero for sort benchmarks, I don't know how much I have to go over this, but I will. And if you Google sort benchmark or uh, go to this page, you'll learn everything you ever wanted to about this. So there have basically been two flavors of sort benchmarks. One measures pure performance. So minute sort asks, how many records can you sort in a minute? Terabyte sort asks, how fast can you sort a terabyte? And then there are the price performance sort. And that's come in two flavors, and it's kind of evolved. So the first is penny sort, how many records can you sort for a penny? And then it kind of evolved to price performance sort, how many records per dollar can you sort if you sort for one minute? And so because sort already had this sort of resource efficiency question built into the benchmark suite, we thought adding an energy efficiency piece to it was a logical thing to do. So the initial dual sort proposal was like this. Our workload was the same workload as the other sort benchmarks has been, which is to sort a bunch of 100-byte records based on their 10-byte keys. Additionally, to make I.O. a part of this, you need to take it from a file on non-volatile storage to a file on non-volatile storage. And I think we changed the word disk to non-volatile storage to kind of anticipate things like flash memory, which we definitely want to allow. So the next question is, you have this workload. How do you compare systems? And there are two questions to that. One is, how do you weigh power and performance? Because your metric needs to involve the balance of both, but is it one-to-one, -one or what do you do? And we decided to, in fact, make it one-to-one, -to, -one to measure energy, and to have the benchmark winners report both of those so that if you care about MIPS squared per watt or power squared per, per, per performance, you can calculate that yourself. And that's essentially a subjective decision that it's impossible to defend in every situation, but that's what we went with. So even when you have that figured out, there's still questions of, how do you run the benchmark? And they matter. So there are three things you can do. One is you can fix the energy budget, where energy is average power times time, remember. So you know, here's your power, here's your performance. And compare the numbers of records sorted. Or you can fix the number of records and just compare the energy to do the sort. I apologize. I, uh, <laughs> I've really done this talk before, and it didn't run away with me. Um, and finally, the, the last thing you can do is to fix the time budget and compare records sorted per joule. So give like a one minute budget, like minute sort, and like price performance sort, and measure records sorted in joules. And there are advantages and disadvantages associated to all of these. So with fixing the energy budget, there are a couple problems. One is that for different systems, different amounts of energy will be reasonable. So if I specify using a kilojoule for the sort, that's going to be really rough on a handheld and like instantaneous for most servers. So you're going to need a whole bunch of benchmark classes. The second problem is that from the point of view of the benchmarker, energy is the product of power and time, both of which vary between runs of sort a little bit. So pity the poor benchmarker who's trying to get within a certain joule budget and trying to get right up close, and he's got these two things varying on him. So we rejected that for those reasons. If you fix the number of records and compare energy, now you don't have the problem of the poor benchmarker because he tells it to sort X records and go. But you do have the problem of different numbers of records are suitable for different machines. So that's, again, going to necessitate multiple benchmark classes. The final solution is pretty attractive because with a one-minute time budget, for example, every system can sort per minute. They're going to do really different things, but everybody can do it. But the assumption that this kind of hinges on is that records sorted per joule is going to be roughly constant for a given machine for different numbers of records. Otherwise, you're really comparing apples to oranges, comparing one machine sorting very few records with another sorting very many. And so what we found out is that that is, in fact, a very bad assumption. So 
This is our winning machine that we designed, and it's sorting different number of numbers of records, that's the x-axis. And the y-axis is sorted records per joule, or what we wanted the metric to be. And here's what's going on in this graph. So when it starts out, those first few data points are like within a matter of a few seconds. And what's going on there is the benchmark, the, sorry, the overhead of the sort program is being amortized. So you're getting more energy efficient as just that initial startup is averaged over more records. And that goes on up till about 15 million records at this point. And this is the largest sort that fits in memory, which means you're only doing one pass to and from disk. And so that's highly energy efficient, more than 16,000 records per joule, and takes less than 10 seconds. If you sort one more record than fits in memory, you drop to here, a little less than 12,000 records per joule. And so for this particular system, the smartest thing to do, actually, would be to do a one-pass sort, 10 seconds, and sleep for the remaining 50 seconds on a one-minute time budget. And uh, we're actually trying to benchmark systems when they're sorting and not when they're sleeping, so this is not good. The second problem, which you don't really see on this graph, unfortunately, because we didn't have enough disk space to show it to you, is at the right end. So there are basically two processes going on in sort. There's the sequential I.O., there's a lot of it, and the amount of work there is just proportional to n, the number of records. And then there's the sort, the computational complexity of which is n log n. And the constants on these are huge and wildly varying for different systems, but what's going to happen eventually for large enough numbers of records is that n log n is going to dominate. And so this is going to trail off, which means that the exact same system for different time budgets is going to look different. And that two systems that would sort a fixed number of records in the same number of joules, depending on how capable they are of sorting, uh, sorting quickly, are going to have two different benchmark scores. So that doesn't seem fair. So we decided fixed number of records is the only way to go because of what this graph tells us. And that means, unfortunately, multiple benchmark classes. And so we declared three. 10 gigs, which is appropriate to a laptop or maybe a small desktop. 100 gigs, which is suitable for a big desktop or a small server. And one terabyte, which is like terabyte sort, suitable for server or cluster. And we declare the winner to be the system with the minimum energy. However, we still like to report sorted records per joule for two reasons. One, it's kind of like miles per gallon for cars. Makes you remember that we're doing an energy efficiency thing. And the second is that you can make rough comparisons between different benchmark classes if you understand the caveats that were presented in the last graph. So you can compare systems that sorted different numbers of records using this metric if you keep in mind that it's not 100% scrupulously fair. Finally, we know we're going to have to adjust these classes as technology improves. The original sort benchmark was proposed in 1985, and it was sort a million records, which became ridiculous at some point and has been retired. And so we know that this is going to have to evolve. Luckily, because sorts are bottlenecked right now on I.O., and I.O. is not improving at the speed of Moore's Law, we expect these to last for a good five years. Yes? Right. So why should I be punished for the fact that, it, that the threshold is lower and when I can actually do more? Well, so that solves the n log n problem, as you noted. Um, so, you know, if you found a way to make your system more efficient at very large n, good for you. But the problem that it doesn't solve is for this particular system with a certain minimum, say a minimum of, you know, 10 million records, you can sleep for the rest of the, for the, rest of the budget. Oh, I see what you're saying. So yeah, what you're basically going to end up getting, though, on most systems is like these one-pass sorts. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's going to be really difficult, I think, and unfair to compare across systems. Uh, I'm saying you still use the three categories. So oh, OK, so and make them minima. minima. OK. But if you do more, right. since, since what you're reporting is just that ratio, right. if you're optimized to do even more than that, uh, then you don't get punished for the fact that the, the benchmark is, was requesting something that's actually smaller than your optimum. OK. I'll have to think about that. I'm not sure. Again, I think, I think the most fair thing to do right, is to compare the same workload. And if you're not comparing the same workload, you're resting on the premise that, the, uh, that machine sorting different amounts of records are going to be basically as efficient. So.
Right. 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 And and I think that's a fair comparison if you're comparing a fixed number of records. But you know, that's truly for that workload, you know, you have a lot of memory, you've made that choice, and we can compare things about your energy efficiency. I think if you're comparing systems with sort of different numbers of records, you have to be really careful about things like that. And I guess I guess I'm just not seeing Right. Whatever the required memory is, basically. Right. This is 1.5 gigs, actually. Yeah. And you're doing less records than you're optimizing. Right. You're going to pay a penalty to keep that memory on the system anyway. So you still will have a fair comparison at that sort of one terabyte mark. Do um, you, you see what I mean? No, run through that again, please. Right. Because you want to get that, that curve, so you're still going to pay a penalty for overbuilding that machine. Right. So if you're comparing two machines that, you know, one has, say, say it's one terabyte of memory, it's a breaking point. Right. One has one terabyte of memory, and you optimize another very, very similar with 1.5 terabyte of memory. Right. You're only measuring the one terabyte. Right. Uh, then you're going to pay a penalty for that extra half a terabyte of memory. Right. So you're going to negatively impact you at that, at that point. At that point, right. So Right. 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 I mean, I think, you know, the gold standard is to do the same work and make a comparison. If you can get away without doing the same work and gain something like we wanted to gain, you know, inclusiveness and history proof, it's worth a shot. But if you find that it's unfair, if, you know, if you find that whatever metric you're looking at does in fact depend on the workload size, I think you have to go back to fixing the workload size. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there is a thing called TPC benchmark. Right. If you consider it, after all, scalability is defined in this benchmark. And all the pricing policies are defined in this benchmark. And you can run it on everything from the laptop to your cluster. TPCC on a laptop? Yeah. Right. 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 Who is the person that's going to put up the money to have a benchmark that is qualified? What's the economic value to the industry? Right. So what's historically the use of the sort benchmark has historically been distinct from benchmarks like SPEC and TPCC, in that it's primarily been used by researchers to say, look, this type of system is getting good at this particular thing. No, you know. I rarely use this to argue. Is it really? It's a billion dollars on your TPCC. No, but sort. Oh, sort. Sort, yeah. Once, once sync sort was declared the overall winner, people lost interest in yeah. economic sort. They, they, clean, they clean house through the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Uh, but after that, nobody cared. And, and that was one of the things that software got again. But this is about power. Yeah. Right. If we're going to be fair right. and iron out all the hardware differences, right. who is going to run the benchmark and why? Okay. So what I believe for the sort benchmark is that it's going to be used by researchers as it has been. So I think to say it's a software-only benchmark these days is misleading when one of the most revelatory things recently was that the 2006 penny sort winner was GPU TerraSort. In other words, they found out a way to get extremely good economic performance and we'll see actually pretty good energy efficiency out of a GPU which is new hardware that's being introduced. And additionally, again, the transition from supercomputers to clusters is both the software and the hardware.
sell the farm. We're going to have a research bed farm that we're referring to you. We're going to sell it to hardware vendors. If you run this, then you will, you will survive and win in the marketplace. That's a three to four year outcome. But that's, that's not what I'm trying to do with it. No, I think what he was proposing was to use the insights gained in system design to design better systems and then evaluate those using existing benchmarks, if I understand you correctly. Right. 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 So, right. What I, I mean, what I see the, the sort benchmark is historically being used for is bringing, you know, price performance, for example, say, to the attention of the database community. And what Jewel Sort has been doing is, again, how do we design these systems for energy efficiency? And I think it's been successful in raising these questions and introducing people in that community to this issue and what you might possibly do about it. And that's really its primary goal. On TPCC, though, I'm not opposed to using TPC per watt as a benchmark. And obviously, SORT doesn't cover everybody's workload. So that's a fine thing to do. That's just the scope of this is more modest. But part of the scope here is also, as you said, scalability from right. the TPC, the benchmark which a lot of work went into it, quite a lot of people worked hard to define it. So the scalability of defining the TPC makes sense. OK. So you can, in some sense, as it were, compare a small PC almost like a computer okay. with 128 processor cluster. Okay. So there is plenty of background thinking going into that and plenty of definitions which are standard and understood in the industry. Okay. Therefore, we can forget about this discussion of whether this is used by the researcher or, or God forbid, man, man, uh, marketers will use it. I mean, who cares as long right. as this is a very wide and precisely defined problem. Right. So, okay, just because... TPCC or TPC is precisely defined doesn't mean that the energy efficiency version wouldn't run into some difficulties, and we chose to attack this one first. I think that is also a worthwhile thing to attack. Right. Right. I mean, yeah, I think looking at other, other workloads from the point of view of energy efficiency is extremely important. We proposed, in addition to the sort benchmark suite, which has, you know, what we like a tradition in the database community, we like the fact that it's already been used to consider resource efficiency. So it's our starting place. This is the first completely specified benchmark. And the reason it is is because we started with something where this was a fairly logical and easy add-on. So I think I described that we're going to use three different classes. We're going to look at the minimum energy. And the final thing, which is just a note, is that the SORT benchmark has historically had two categories, Daytona for hardware commodity components and software that's supported, and Indy for whatever crazy stuff you want to do. And the reason uh, 100 gigs and Daytona are highlighted is that's the uh, category we focused our system design effort on, which I'll be talking about later. So the energy measurement setup, and this is our system, but I think it's how almost any system would do it, just to give you a feel, is we're measuring the total power of the system, so the wall AC power. Plug a power meter into the wall. This is the one we used. And then you plug your sorting system into the power meter. So what the power meter gives you is how much power the sorting system is consuming. Then there's another piece, which is the monitoring system, which is taking the readings from the power meter and also taking care of the timing of the sort to make sure that it's correlating power and when the sort was going on correctly. So it's initiating the sort and bringing those two numbers together. We also need some rules about the measurement of energy. 
So the first thing is, because sort time and power are both pretty variable from run to run, you need to take at least three consecutive readings and report the average, which is what we've done for all our numbers. The second thing is we want to measure power at the wall, because we want this to be full system power, so all components. And it counts the attached cooling devices, so the fans but not the air conditioning in the room. We borrowed the power meter specifications, the accuracy of the meter itself, from the spec power and EPA, because that's one piece that they do have fully specified. And finally, we specified that you need to maintain an ambient temperature at the system inlets of 20 to 25 degrees Celsius, which is a pretty reasonable server number. And the reason there is just so that you can't run the benchmark in your frozen underground layer and take the fans out of the system. So that's the benchmark specification. And now what I'm going to describe is the machine we built to win the benchmark, and additionally the machines we compared it with to judge this winning. Um, so it's three and a half times better than anything else we looked at, and it's a very unusual machine, so it's kind of interesting from that point of view as well. <laughs> Itanium was not um, considered, <laughs> although as an HP-affiliated person, I'm sure it would do great. Um, So, um, oh, I, sh I should have mentioned, actually, that um, the machines, probably a lot of you know this, the machines that tend to win performance sorts are, you know, these just huge clusters. The machines that tend to win penny sort are desktop size machines, for the most part, just for what it's worth. So, the first thing we did when we set out to design a system, <laughs> great. Uh, the first thing we did when we set out to design a system is we looked at the previous sort benchmark winners <laughs> and... Um, because the sort benchmark winners turn in reports about what hardware they used, we were able to give to get rough estimates of the power they consumed, especially since there was very little dynamic variation in component power at that time. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt, but the larger points should be pretty much true. So the first thing we see is that the performance sorts are doing a lot worse than the penny sort. Performance sorts are the blue triangles, and penny sorts are the pink squares. And the reason for that is not surprising. Penny sort is the benchmark that considers a resource constraint, and cost and power do sort of correspond. In other words, with penny sort, you know, if you have a disk that you're not using, there is an incentive to take it out, just like in a dual sort. Additionally, in general, especially in the past, cheaper components would tend to be lower power. So these two metrics are somewhat similar, which is why penny sort winners are doing a lot better. So the, perfor so the performance sorts, we're improving. You'll have to trust that we actually fitted a curve to this. Um, the arrow looks pretty bogus. Um, the performance sorts were improving about 12% a year in energy efficiency, according to these estimates. And uh, the cost efficiency sorts were improving at 24% a year. And neither of these match the speed at which they were improving at their actual metric performance or cost performance. And so that gives us two conclusions. One is that energy efficiency isn't improving very fast, which is part of it, of course, and which is one reason we need a benchmark. The other is that these are not the most energy efficient systems of their, their day, which is also probably true, since it's not what they were going for. And again, it would be good to have a benchmark so that we would know what the most energy efficient systems were and be able to make real comparisons. Oh, I should also mention that this winning point up here is GPU Terasort, which is interesting because we don't traditionally associate GPUs with energy efficiency. But the GPU that they used in this particular work was fairly modest power-wise, about 61 watts, which was about the same as their CPU. And they got a whole lot of performance bang for that buck. So that was actually the most energy efficient system of the historical sorts, give or take, which was surprising to us. So then, because we were at HP, we ran around and measured some representative systems from the lab. So we had a low power blade, a low end server, one processor, two disks, a really nice modern laptop with a core to do and three gigs of memory, and then a file server we constructed and specifically meticulously balanced CPU and I.O., as you do when you're tuning a sort benchmark winner. So here's GPU Terrasort, 3200 records per joule. And again, remember, we're comparing systems with sort of different numbers of records. So all the usual caveats apply. Um, the blade looks terrible because it was in an enclosure that was, is provisioned to hold 16 blades. So you're operating at a low efficiency point. You have a lot of overhead that you don't need. When you adjust for that, you're at about 1,200, like the low-end server. So low-end server, 1,200 records per joule. Both of these, as you can see, are bottlenecked on the disk. The CPU isn't very utilized. Then you take the laptop. The laptop gets 3,400 records per joule, which is ballpark, neighborhood of GPU Terrasort. Its CPU is 1% utilized because it's got, you know, a crummy laptop disk. Then we took the sort balance file server, which had two disk trays. We perfectly made sure that CPU and I.O. balanced, so you've got the CPU over 90% utilized, 3,800 records per joule. So these are comparable. A perfectly balanced machine, perfectly utilized, and a laptop with 1% CPU utilization. So what this tells us is one way to design a machine that would be good at this is to design 
a sort balanced laptop, which is what we did. So we switched to mobile components. So the first thing we did was instead of using the Xeon from the file server, we used a Core 2 Duo. And well, we, we lost a little bit of performance, but a lot more power. For our disks, we went from enterprise disks to laptop disks, which were extremely low power. And the machine we built, oh. And so then the next step when you're building a sort efficient machine is to make sure the CPU and I.O. are balanced. So what this is, is we're trying to add enough disks to fully utilize the CPU. And uh, here you can see the performance and sorted records per joule climbing until we get to 13 laptop disks. And we stopped there because um, it's pretty hard to find a motherboard that'll let you run a mobile CPU on the desktop. And this one was running out of I.O. bandwidth real quick. But we, the CPU was pretty well above 90% at this point. So we think 13 disks is a pretty balanced uh, setup on this system. This is the system. So we've got a mobile core 2 duo here on one of these rare motherboards that lets you do this. And what we like about this motherboard is it has two PCI Express slots, which is not always a given on these motherboards, which let us plug in two disk controllers and 13 SATA laptop disks. And uh, we played a little more with like the CPU frequency and the file system and things like that, which results are in the paper. But the upshot is this machine sorted 11,300 records per joule, which compared to the about 3,500 that we were seeing. The average power during sort was 100 watts, which is less than many desktops, about three times a laptop. And the software, I mentioned that we held it constant for all these experiments. Um, NSORT, uh, Ordinal Technology gener generously donated their NSORT, which has been used in a lot of the winning sort benchmark systems in the past. So what does this tell us, that we built basically a laptop file server with 13 disks? Well, the first was that the low-hanging fruit here was to use low-power hardware for better power performance trade-off. But, of course, you still need to construct it so that you're fully utilizing all those resources. So one challenge here would be to make sure we have adequate interfaces to try and bring low-power components into servers. The second thing that I just want to note is the issue of scale-down efficiency, or what uh, Luis Barroso is starting to call energy proportional computing, which is that today's components have a fairly limited dynamic range. Uh, their idle power, in other words, is a fairly high fraction of their peak power. What that means today is that for fixed hardware, you get peak power efficiency at the point of peak performance. And that's, of course, what sort, bench, what, uh, sort tests. So what we're interested in is how can we design machines that would perform equally well in different benchmark classes rather than having this one point at which they're very efficient and others at which they're not very well suited. There are, of course, some limitations to this benchmark beyond the, what we've already discussed. One is that it does test energy efficiency at high utilization for current systems because you know, this is an artifact of the fact that your most energy efficient point right now is peak utilization. But most servers are underutilized. And what this benchmark does not test, and what a TPC-based benchmark might, is how efficient is the system at 50% utilization or 20%, which is a real data center scenario. And spec power is working in this space. The other thing is that it doesn't measure building power or cooling. Now, for the machine that we built, which is sitting in a lab at Stanford, it makes sense that we don't want to include the power of the Stanford Computer Science building in the benchmark. But if you're looking at the data center level, you maybe do want a more holistic measure, and that's what the green grid is up to. And finally, it's important to note that the real goal, of course, would be a TCO source, total cost of ownership. But the components of that are extremely variable from your electric bill to your software costs to things that relate to your building design. And so we're not doing that. But dual sort giving you the energy efficiency and penny sort giving you the cost efficiency of the hardware and software give you pieces of the answer that you can then integrate. So the conclusions of dual sort are, first of all, that an energy efficiency benchmark has been missing, that we fully specified one that is simple, representative, and for the full system that we built a system that was much more energy efficient than the previous uh, estimated winner. And we did it by connecting mobile components with server class interfaces. And that this has been adopted as part of the SORT benchmark suite. So if you, uh, you're welcome to submit for 2008. And uh, jewelsort.stanford.edu has the current information. So I'll take questions. Yeah. I'm sorry, I missed the amount of memory on your information. Yeah, so actually, um, it had space for, we had two one gig DIMMs, and the energy efficiency about balanced out. So in other words, the gain of having the second dim and the power kind of canceled out. So I think we ran it with both dims in, but it really didn't matter. And the reason for that is that if you, if you don't have enough memory to do it all in one pass, but you have enough to do it all in two passes, adding more doesn't help you very much. So the problem with that is the constants. Okay. 
So you have huge constants associated with the n component, the sequential I.O., and with the n log n component. And for any particular system, you don't really know when that n log n is going to kick in. So to just divide by n log n wouldn't work very well either. Well, I can definitely tell you that at the lower classes, for example, this problem didn't kick in on our winning system for the classes that we measured. Um, I didn't, the only terabyte one we did was the file server, so I can't specifically say what I have or haven't seen. But yeah, the problem is just that it's a more complicated function of n than either n, which is, you know, what we originally did essentially, or n log n. So therefore, you need to compare apples to apples by fixing the workload. Thank you.